Welcome everybody. So glad that you're here with us for our August edition of Native Plants at Noon. I'd like to start out um, with a special warm welcome for two new faces who are joining us here at Deep Roots. I'd like to welcome our new project coordinators, Tammy Thompson and Jahida Aguilar. Tammy and Jahida, would you want to introduce yourselves? Tammy, why don't you go ahead and go first? Hi guys, I'm so excited to be part of Deep Roots and so excited to start working with Sydney and Alex on the MDC team. So you guys do such a great job and I'm excited to see what we learned today. Hello everyone, my name is Jahida Aguilar and I'm also very excited. Um, I've been watching Sydney and Alex's videos secretly even though I said I wouldn't as a surprise and I'm really excited because they look really fun. So thanks for tuning in and hope you enjoy the show. Thanks Jahida and Tammy, we're so excited to have you both here with us. Um, as our viewers may remember, we have our Planet Native Conference coming up soon here at Deep Roots and our preparations are in full swing for that. Um, so um, in preparation for that, Tammy and Jahida are going to be stepping in to host Native Plants at noon next month. So you'll be seeing Tammy on screen and Jahida will be helping in the background to answer your questions um, and keep an eye on the Facebook stream. So um, we are offering our Native Plants at noon viewers a discount on Planet Native registration. So stay tuned at the end of our episode to get your special code for that. Just a couple of quick reminders um, before we get started. If you have questions, please put those in the Q&A tool on Zoom uh, or in the comments on Facebook. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can. They are a lot easier for us to keep track of if they're in the Q&A than they are in the chat. And we wanna make sure that we answer just as many as possible. Before we start, I wanna give a big thanks to the Missouri Department of Conservation, without whom we wouldn't be sitting here doing native plants at noon every single month. Um, it has been just such a blast to do. And um, we are thankful for everything that MDC does to encourage folks to plant native plants. And without further ado, I am excited to turn it over to Alex and Sydney at the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center. They are native landscape specialists. And Alex, Sydney, take it away. Tell us what we're talking about today. Hello, I'm Hi. Sydney. I'm Alex. And as Sarah mentioned, we're here at the Discovery Center here in Kansas City. And today we're going to be talking about a couple things, uh, primarily about yellow composite flowers that you can see in bloom this time of year. Uh, but to start things off, we're going to talk a little bit about some nocturnal pollinators, just very briefly. Um, Alex and I did this awesome program here at the Discovery Center earlier this week, uh, focusing on nocturnal pollinators. Um, so if you are interested in moths or other insects like beetles, mosquitoes, thrips, uh, crane flies, flies, wasps. All, wasps, all the other pollinators that don't get enough credit, um, we encourage you to do a little bit of research and see who is pollinating your garden when the sun goes down. Um, so for this program we did, um, we set up something called a mothing station, which is essentially just a bed sheet hanging from a rope between two trees and shining UV black lights onto them um, and using something called a moth bait, which is just like a sugary fermentation um, to attract these insects. It was a lot of fun and we used this awesome book called The Peterson Guide. Peterson Field Guide to Moths of Northeastern North America. Uh, it is all encompassing. Um, I, I'm a huge moth fan specifically. So this is kind of like a, a nice treat for me. Um, and we also during that program had our friend Linda Williams, shout out to Linda who came. She is the moth queen and moth expert here in Missouri. And she gifted us this beautiful uh, imperial moth. So anyway, this is a great time of year to see the moths and other nocturnal insects in your backyard. Um, so whether you set up a mothing station or just turn your porch light on at night and observe who is coming through, uh, you'll be surprised to see uh, these nocturnal pollinators in your area. How many moths do we have in Missouri? Oh my gosh, okay, so this is really cool. Um, but, well, first of all, there are, I think it's 12,000 species of moths in North America. 3,000 of which are here in Missouri. Um, a it's a lot of moths and that is 
um, way more, we have way more moths than we do butterflies in North America. So if you think about it, just based on the volume of moth species, they do a huge amount, a huge amount of legwork yeah. for pollination. Um, so anyway, got to root for the underdogs. And I think they're just absolutely beautiful and interesting. So, um, and speaking of pollinators in general, here at the Discovery Center, we do a native plant giveaway twice a year. Um, and our upcoming one is Monarch Mania. And that will be on September 11th. Uh, Alex and I have been busy growing milkweed and other pollinator plants from seed here at the Discovery Center. So come on down. It'll be an in-person event where we uh, talk about the importance of native pollinators in your landscape and go walk away with some really cool plants to add to your garden. So now again, it's September 11th. Join us here at the Discovery Center in Kansas City. Yep, free in all ages. That's right. So now the main chunk of our program today, we will we'll be talking about yellow composite flowers. And Alex is going to um, focus on a couple different of these families. Um, so I don't know if you want to start with yeah. Do you want it? Well, wait, so we, we were talking about the uh, uh, what's in bloom right now is um, the, the botanists have a fun term for this, which mushroom hunters and bird watchers have similar terms. And it's DYCs, darn yellow composites, because there are thousands of them. And some of them are really, really hard to tell apart. But they're really shining right now. They can handle uh, most of them. The, so these are plants in the Asteraceae family. So they range in shape and size, height. They can be crazy tall. We're gonna end with one that's about 15 feet tall out in the prairie here, all the way down to like this Missouri incis, which is maybe about a foot and a half at max height. But these, most of these plants are really adapted to our um, local ecosystem here with, and they can handle the dry, hot droughts that we have. They love the rain, of course but um, they're still blooming right now, as you can see, when most everything has faded, most of the summer blooms have faded, and we're working our way into the fall blooms, and asters really steal the show during the fall, and early, or late summer and early fall, so we're going to talk about a few of those families, so do you want to start off with the golden rods? Yes, Disney? let's do it, okay, okay. so uh, golden rods are one of the most common um, asters you'll see here in the Midwest and um, there's two kinds and they usually get a bad rep. So uh, Alex is first gonna show the Canada golden no, rod. Wait, Canada, yes, yeah, so yeah. this is the one with the bad rep. The bad rep. Yes. And the reason being is people mistake this for ragweed. It's not, it's a yellow flower. People often see this coming up this time of year and they start to get um, allergies. I mean, that's actually the ragweed pollen, not the goldenrod pollen. Yeah. Um, but this, this is a Missouri native, um, goldenrod, but um, it's not one that we would recommend you plant in your garden. It will uh, show up there on its own. It will show up there. It's just, re it's really aggressive. Pollinators do love it. It's a great plant, um, but rather than planting, intentionally planting Canada goldenrod, you might consider planting uh, rigid goldenrod or stiff goldenrod. It's got a lot of common names. Um, Solidago rigida. Yeah. Probably botched that. There we go. But I really like this goldenrod. It doesn't spread as aggressively. Uh, it seems to be about three feet tall and it blooms from now through the end of fall. It does prefer a uh, full sun. It might do okay in part sun. I planted some at my house that gets kind of a part sun situation. I think it could use a little more sun in my the area I have it at, um, but it's nice. And it, um, you see it already has some of the blooms open and there are also more but more blossoms that have yet to open. So it's a long bloomer and you'll see a lot of pollinators like wasps, solitary bees, honeybees, um, flies. Beetles, Tons of butterflies. All kinds, yeah, butterflies love them too. Um, and again, when you're looking uh, to add native plants to your garden, you're thinking about uh, having something in bloom throughout the entire year, definitely consider your golden rods and asters because those kind of steal the show this time of year. So those are uh, two great ones. Yeah, and they're blooming yeah. during the most of the migration of some butterflies, especially right. the monarch. They're blooming during the monarch mig fall migration, yeah. which is really important because the monarchs need the food that, that these plants provide to continue on um, south to Mexico. Yeah, I was also reading um, that goldenrod and asters um, 
or any fall, late summer fall blooming native plants tend to have higher protein values because yeah. pollinate, this is like getting close to the last hurrah for pollinators before we, you know, transition to cooler temperatures. Yeah. So they are getting that, um, that extra nutrients to make those long hauls like the monarch butterfly. So, uh, so those are just two types. Again, we have a uh, rigid goldenrod and Canada goldenrod. Yeah. Uh, check this one out. There's also other types of goldenrod like showy and zigzag and grays and woodland. Cliff, don't forget cliff. cliff. Oh, cliff goldenrod's so beautiful. Cliff goldenrod's so. so cute. Yes. It's a perfect domestic goldenrod. It yeah. will stay where you put it and yeah. it doesn't get crazy tall. No, it doesn't. It has this nice like fountaining effect, especially if you have like a little terrace or something for it to kind of uh, dip over. Yeah. There's a goldenrod for every situation, just yes. like a milkweed for every yeah. situation. I feel like um, when people are thinking about landscape design, they often think about spring flowers and like summer and then totally forget about fall and winter. Uh, but these are some things to be thinking about as you're planning to, maybe you're going to be planting some things in the fall this year. Maybe consider getting some asters and goldenrod. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. And Alex is going to come over here and talk about a few others okay. that we've got. So another, oh, let me start here. I'm going to start with Rebecca's because we're going to go over to Sophiums later. Another um, family that is in the genus of, uh, or uh, another group in, in the Aster family, sorry, I'm trying not to make it too complicated, are the Rudbeckias. They're an Aster as well. That's a composite flower. So they have disc florets and ray florets. So they have flowers. At each petal on the outside is actually an individual flower. And each little flower on the inside, the brown part or the black part for the black eyed Susans or brown eyed Susans, that's a dish for it. So these all questions. look alike. I know. Oh my gosh. Nice. They all, the, we have three different types here. And we've made them even more confusing by putting them in jars because now they're all the same height. And in nature, they're not all the same height at all. So uh, this one, the one that, that uh, Sydney has right here, this is brown eyed Susan, this Rebecca Herta. And that one is the taller one of the um, of the uh, two Rudbeckias that kind of look like this. Here is the shorter one. This is, oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm just learning my Rudbeckias now. So Same. They're, they're really difficult, but we're, we're figuring it all out together. So this one is uh, Missouri coneflower. Rudbeckia missouriensis. Yeah. This one's recommended by certain... Um, native plant nurseries because it does stay, it's more compact and doesn't spread as aggressively. I'm looking at adding these to landscape design. Yeah, it's, but that's the one that I was saying only gets to about one and a half or two foot tall. And then the last one is uh, subtomentosa, Rudbeckia subtomentosa. And that's a uh, much taller Rudbeckia. It's, it, uh, I think where we have it here, it's probably about five, five and a half foot tall. Um, it's gorgeous, it smells so good and it gets visited by pollinators now and then goldfinches <laughs> and Sydney's. Uh, <laughs> so these are all really important food sources pollen wise and then they become really important food sources seed wise and later on every flower we're talking about right here starts off as butterfly food yeah. and it ends up as bird food. Yeah someone I, I saw uh, just commented and said that Rudbeckia heard a spread seeds like crazy and it does and I you know part of that is birds eating them and spreading them as they tear them apart they're very good um, at making, <laughs> making, making babies of themselves. yes yeah. they are so. and some of them yeah. some of them are more perennial uh what we call short-lived perennials where they will stay in the same spot for several years but then maybe die off and some of them but most of them are perennials um, but they act like annuals <laughs> and yeah. they're like spreading seeds like crazy as if they're never going to come back in the same spot. But yeah, yeah they're very pretty. So, so yeah, be careful, be careful for sure. And I was going to say, uh, before we move on to the silphiums, do we want to pause and take yeah, some questions, questions so Sarah? We're going to go into the big, yeah. big giants now. Yep. Excellent. Yes. Let's take a couple of questions. So Loretta says my orange coneflower, Rudbeckia fulgida, is in full bloom, but the leaves look dry and wilted. Should I water it? You can. Um, we. It, it kind of depends on how old the plant is. If you've only had it for one or two years and it's wilting right now, definitely water it. Um, we don't, I don't consider that cheating. We water our new gardens especially during drought times even into the second year if they're starting to look stressed 
we will go ahead and water a two-year-old garden yeah. that, or a two-year-old plant that looks stressed in a drought situation. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not, plant's probably not going to die, but it's not going to look as good for as long. And if you water, it will keep the blooms on yeah, especially, I mean, we just had rain recently, but prior to that, I think it was Missouri or Kansas City at least didn't have like, have rain for almost 20 days, I think. It was really hot. I mean, everything, including us, suffered in that heat. So a little extra water, like Alex said, it's not cheating. Oh, we have, we have goldfinches. <laughs> no, uh, those were hummingbirds well, fighting. Were those hummingbirds fighting? Yeah, they we got dueling hummingbirds. hummingbirds. It, it's bird season. I mean, what is it not bird season, season, but hummingbirds are migrating through. Um, and yeah, yeah, same time as really butterflies. Cool. Yeah. Bottom line, get down here to the Discovery Center because there, <laughs> it's just there are hummingbirds and butterflies everywhere. Right yeah, we're gonna try to catch them on camera. Yeah, <laughs> if you see something zoom past yeah. our face, that's what it is. Yes, that's a great question, though. Um, yeah, Sarah, do you have, are there any other questions that we might answer before we move on? Yeah, Joe says, can you please repeat what you said about members of the Astro family having a higher protein content? Okay, so. Um, the, the plants that are blooming in the fall have a higher protein content or new, I think it's, it's, I would say nutritional content. Um, I don't know for sure if it's protein. No, it's protein versus sugar. Is it protein yeah. versus sugar? But the idea is that these are the last bloomers before we transition to cooler temperatures. So these pollinators uh, need that extra nutrition before going into hibernation or migrating. Um, so that's why it's really important to have things like asters and um, goldenrods and I mean, silphiums too, and helianthus, things like that. So that um, these pollinators get that extra nutrition before it's winter. Not, it's not a coincidence that they're blooming the time of year that the, the, that the butterflies are coming through. Right. That's all by design. Yep. I mean, evolution. Evolutionary. evolutionary design. That's right. It's been in the works for about 10,000 years. <laughs> These plants and bugs have been figuring it out long before we came. Yeah. And we probably have time for one more question, then we'll move on. Um, sure. Jean asks, uh, can you review a couple of uh, favorite goldenrods that do not spread? Okay. Yeah. Well, stiff goldenrod or rigid goldenrod, which is solidago, solidago, <laughs> rigida, depending on how you say it, that would be a great one. Um, what else do you think? Yeah, so cliff goldenrod oh, yeah, is great. Cliff. Um, zigzag mm -hmm. goldenrod is a shorter one that mm -hmm. does well in green gardens. Um, it can do well in a wetter situation. Um, blue, uh, nope, sorry, gray goldenrod is one. Gray goldenrod and bottle brush goldenrod. Ooh, uh, oh, that's gosh. cool. I'm not as familiar with bottle brush. I'll, we, I just plant, I designed and planted a bed by the, our pond over here and come back in two falls. This fall it'll bloom too, but I put tons of different gold. It's going to be so there. beautiful. It's, it's going to be a I can't yellow, <laughs> sea of yellow over there. So this year they will start to bloom and they're, they're showing up for sure. Yeah. There. But um, there are, there are, ton, there are lots of different gold rods that are native lots of solidago species that are native to the midwest but only a select few have been um chosen to be cultivated for um uh, planting uh, yeah. in, a, in a domestic situation i was gonna say um, w wouldn't you agree that as long as it's not a canada gold or yeah canada golden rod that they're not gonna i mean they don't spread as aggressively as canada golden yeah rod, canada so. golden rod is the bad boy that gets it that's that's the one that has the reputation. Everyone right. thinks all golden rods act like Canada golden rods, but mm -hmm. that's just not true. As far as I've seen. Yeah. Uh, we recently started growing um, woodland golden rod, which I'm not familiar with yeah. at all, but we grew that from seed. So I'm really excited to see how that turns out. Yeah, um, and that one can handle part shade, right. dry part shade. Yeah. Because it's more of a glades fan of species. Edge of and, a woodland kind of deal. Yeah. yeah. Whereas most of the golden rods need full sun. Um, so it depends on your situ your yard situation as well. For sure. Yeah. And now, without further ado, <laughs> check out this bad boy. Yeah. Big as your face. Big as yeah. our face. So, right. so we'll move on to the silphiums. The silphiums are some of the most charismatic uh, prairie plants that we have out there. Um, they can be found on any, anywhere from wetlands to glades to savannas, but mostly in our upland prairies. And silphiums have just the largest flowers. The one that Sydney's holding right there is called Prairie Duck. It's got a tiny flower, but it's got a ginormous leaf. Look at that. Huge. And That's it's, the, yeah. It's really rough. It's huge, isn't yeah. it? It's really rough. And the leaves stand straight up when you 
there if you can picture it see it's tricky to film these plants <laughs> because they're so huge so again i say you have to just come down and see them in real life because it's hard to to uh portray how how large and in charge they are <laughs> yeah it's true so their their leaves stand straight up similarly to this other sylphium this is our native compass plant compass yeah plant. this is really cool i love the shape of the leaf and here's the flowers larger than the prairie dock flowers yeah. so the the leaves are large and flat and they're very uniquely shaped they're very deeply cut lobes on the leaf of this plant, of this sylphium. And the reason the common name comes from the uh, fact that at about two weeks old, the compass plant leaves stand straight up and their edges face north and south. So that's, if you turn it, turn, there you go. Now they're north and south. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're technically now, north and south, but yeah, it would be, yeah. yeah. Uh, but if you've been to the Discovery Center, <laughs> you can orient yourself that way. And the reason is that, th that these, these plants both have uh, le leaves that stand up like this is so that they're not facing broadly the sun. Like they're not facing, they're, they're, they're reducing their um, solar intake uh, during the day by standing straight up and having either just one side exposed or the other. And um, they also, in the case of their bear, the leaves are very rough mm -hmm. textured. And one of the uh, advantages to that is that they collect um, each, because there's so much surface texture on each leaf, they collect the morning dew. And that's what we're gonna show you on the next giant silphium that we have. Oh, it's so cool. They all have in common the textured, really highly textured leaves. Feels like sandpaper. It like, does, right? Yeah. Like kitten cats. Tongue. Kitten tongue. Yeah. That'd be a really rough kitten tongue, though, I gotta say. Really <laughs> oh, wait, I wanted to talk about one more thing. Um, because oh, yeah. I have this plant here. I don't know. Can you see? Can you hold this so that you can see the cut on that? The sulfium borer? Right here. Uh, or this one? Uh, this, I think this one right here. Oh, this yeah. That see right it. This might be a little tricky. We have a uh, an insect that showed up here a couple of years, years ago that's endemic to tall grass prairies. And it's called the sulfium borer weevil. And it's a weevil that that cuts, you can see the cut right there. It cuts into the stem underneath the bud of the silphium flowers and it lays its egg in there. And the, the larva develop inside the bud of the flower, usually breaking the, the flower bud off of there. Yeah, it sounds but they, they've seemed to have taken turns um, and moved from different plants. Like this last year, they really took out the prairie dog. Mm -hmm. um, but this year they seem to be going after more of the compass plant. At least so, they're spreading it out a little bit. Yeah, it's cool <laughs> to have like an endemic insect show up, but also they're destroying the blooms a little bit. <laughs> uh, what are what are bugs? What are baby beetles? What are baby bugs? But bird food. food. So, so that's yeah. Matters. It We're not matters. just planting for our own aesthetic pleasures we're planting for baby birds baby birds baby and birds. butterflies and bees and everything in between that's right, that's right. <laughs> oh did you see that a monarch just flew right by your head <laughs> <laughs> i felt it i felt the wings okay so should we walk over to let's head over do we have any questions while we walk to the um cup plant The Q&A is clear. So if awesome. you have questions, go ahead and drop them in there. Um, let's see. Oh, we did have one come over from Facebook. Just a minute. And Fawn wanted to know, uh, or I read that Rutabecchia fulgida has four foot long roots. Is that Woo. true? That sounds right. Uh, yeah, that's a, I, I have no clue, but you I know. I would say four foot wide as opposed to four foot long. Um, they, the pra prairie plant, so prairie plants are typically, sometimes they do send their roots straight down, but a lot of times they're sending their roots out instead of down mm -hmm. and that's to gather as much water. So when we do dig up the prairie plants and like measure their roots, it sounds more impressive to say they grow in straight down that far but it's really, more like a, more like a yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so um this is our cup plant forest yeah check this out alex how tall are you I'm five eight. she's five eight yeah. look how tall these suckers are so i love this plant it's a crazy huge giant 
and it doesn't make sense in a lot of uh, urban native landscapes. But if you can get away with it, uh, if you can find a spot where this make this plant makes sense, it is well worth the trouble of cutting it down. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the monarch that just flew by? There's oh. monarchs feeding on the nectar as well as carpenter bees, bumblebee. I mean, everything. Oh, there's some more. Oh, swallowtail. Oh what is that? Gosh, Which one is tiger. that? Tiger. Oh my gosh, it looks like half black it, and half yellow. So we're okay. learning. Yeah. So there's some interesting swallowtail butterflies here in Missouri and we're uh, learning the difference between them. I thought, I didn't realize yeah. that the black swallowtails were the same uh, or were just, what, what is it? They're the theme tiger. as the yeah, tiger. Black morph. Black morph. black morph. Yeah. So the, so the black, so black butterflies that we've seen, that was a tiger and I can tell because it was half and half. It yeah. may have been, we might need to actually catch that butterfly. Yeah. Let's try to catch that. Yes. That one looks insane. Yeah, but typically the tiger, what tiger butterflies are, are Tiger swallowtails are either yellow with black stripes or black. And we also have the Eastern tiger or Eastern black swallowtail, which feeds on um, like dill and parsley and fennel and uh, our native bull now Sanders. And that one is coming out right now. We're seeing a lot of those. Then we also have the spice bush swallowtail, yes. which we might see because that's a black swallowtail as well. We might see that because we have spice bush planted around here. Yeah. So this is the place to come. If you come to visit, come to yep. the kelp plant forest because you're going to see yeah. all kinds of butterflies. In it's on the way to the pond. So the pond is just down this path here if you're familiar with our center. But uh, yeah, so cup plant is what we're focusing on right now. And Alex, yeah. why is this called a cup plant? So the reason it's called a cup plant is you find a good because... juicy one. I should, <laughs> I should have found this one. Ooh, what about this one? Is there anything in here? Stuff in it. Huh. All the cups are dried oh, up, boy. But usually, typically, these cups. Okay, if I looked long enough, we don't have time. But if I looked long enough, I would find one with water in it. Mm -hmm. Can we? Yeah. Can you just show that while I? Yeah. You see this little divot here, and it goes all the way down the, the stem. This holds water it, from um, dew and uh, rain. And it uh, provides water for birds and insects. They drink out of them, hence the name cup plant. Um, I love how thick and square this stem is. Yeah, so it's check also that called out. carpenter's plant because of the square stem. You can use it to, I don't know, measure stuff. Or Me stuff. <laughs> measure stuff. What you could you could build some structures with that, some yeah. wild structures. And we do use this plant for structures in our nature play area. When yeah, we, we do. Down in the fall. Yeah. Let's get a little close up on the flower. Yeah, this is another DYC, a darn yellow composite. And you can see that the sylphium weavers have cut into these buds too. This is oh, the, the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh what yeah, weavers. 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 Oh, these, <laughs> the sylphium borers. And there's probably, well, I can't see, but there's probably a large- But you there. can see where they've snapped the little yeah. heads. But you can also see where, actually look at that. That's kind of funny. It broke, it, it ate into the bud here but then it started two new buds right there. So all of these plants, and one of the great things about native plants is that they are, um, they have evolved to be able to handle damage. They can handle herbivory, storm damage, breaking from the wind, like, you know, all this kind of stuff, and they can recover. They can handle getting 50% of their bones of uh, being habitat, uh, hab being Inhabitant. habitat for, larva of a beetle because mm -hmm. they can they feel that happen and then they put their uh Just keep buds out in the same exact spot to try again so right resilient. they are resilient and if you think about it i mean these plants need these insects in order to further their life cycle um, so, you know, what's losing a few buds to some bugs, right? They can just, it's all, it's a nice, uh, what's the word? Reciprocated relationship. It's reciprocal. So <laughs> anyway, so these are uh, some of the, the darned yellow composites yeah. that you can see in bloom. Um, there are certain techniques you can use to identify them. We love to use the app iNaturalist. It's a free app. We haven't talked about this app in, I don't know, a month. No. <laughs> Um, this is really great. Uh, it's free. It's on your phone. You take a photo, it helps you ID. And those, uh, that data is used for uh, furthering conservation efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great way to identify. And we only talked to, how many did we talk about? We only talked about maybe half of the ones. That oh my gosh, I know. There's, yeah. There's we had to limit it. We had to put a cap yeah. on it. Yes. <laughs>
Well, do we have any final questions before we conclude today's native plants at noon? Yes, I think we have time for one more. Fawn asks, which sylphium lives 100 years? Well, I don't know. I don't That's know. Do you know? Is that, know. Is that a pop quiz for us? I don't. Time? I don't. Um, I, I don't know. A hundred years. Compass plants um, live that long? What's that? Do compass plants live that long? I don't know. I mean, Maybe. like, I obviously trees can live that long, but I'm thinking of like forbs and stuff that they would yeah. have to. So, Sylvia, Sil when we were talking about uh, the uh, perennial versus like a short lived perennial versus an annual, sylphiums are definitely perennial, hardcore perennials. They're going to show up in the same spot every year, um, most of them. But I don't know. Someone must have recorded one that bloomed for a hundred years in a row or something. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. If, oh. I wanted that too. Uh, I know. We'll have that... to look that up. Sorry, Fawn. We don't have an answer for you today. Um, maybe, we'll, maybe, it we'll maybe it was a it was a pop quiz or something for <laughs> us. If, if you know, definitely. you should let us know because that would be really interesting to learn. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. All right. So thank you, Alex and Sydney. This has been so much fun. Um, I hope everybody heads down to the Discovery Center um, to practice your DYCs uh, and um, see if you can spot some of these um, family in the plantings there. Um, so before we continue, whoops, one moment. There we go. All right. So I promised we would do a discount code for hanging out with us at lunch today. So please use code NPN to register for our Planet Native Conference. Um, this is an online native landscaping conference. We have a mix of both online sessions over the course of three days that you can attend from anywhere. Um, we'll have everything recorded so you can watch it later if you need to. And we have a couple of field trips for those who are local to Kansas City, one of which is a tour with Alex and Sydney at the Discovery Center. So a couple of hours worth of just soaking up of that native plants at noon discovery center goodness so um, we hope that you will uh, join us there and if you've missed any of our episodes you can find those at deeproots.org um, take a look at the webinar page you can find all of our previous webinars and episodes of native plants at noon and while you're there we'd be grateful if you would consider making a donation to help us continue our work well, we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and we'll look forward to seeing you next time uh, back here on September 16th. Thank you so much, Alex and Sydney. Everybody have a great afternoon.